All right, hello everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Kim Elena Ionescu. I am the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Specialty Coffee Association. Um, and I'm really pleased to be on this call to have this group assembled today for our second webinar in a series of webinars on profitability. Um, the first one of these happened in January of this year and it's available to watch on SCA news.coffee. If you have not watched that one yet, that might be a great place to, um, to go after this, after this one. Uh, we also have a, a paper that I would encourage all of you listening to this to read, if you have not already, on our available research site for the FCA. And that speaks to the fact that while this particular webinar was hastened by the recent fall in the commodity futures market price for coffee. This is a topic, farm profitability and farm prosperity, that has been a, a focal point and an issue of concern for the Specialty Coffee Association and its members and community for years now. And um, the webinar series was really inspired by and has been led by a group of volunteers within the Specialty Coffee Association Sustainability Center focused on farm profitability and prosperity as a critical issue for the future of our industry and our entire sector. So um, with that, I will uh, hand the moderator role over to Ashley Prentice, who's a member of that Farm Profitability and Prosperity Working Group. Um, she's a third generation coffee farmer from Guatemala and um, someone I greatly admire. So Ashley, take it away. Thanks, Kim, and good morning to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, since the last webinar, and more specifically on August 20th, um, the seed market fell below the $1 marker, which stirred up a lot of outrage, especially from the farmer side, due to the low value of coffee. But the value of coffee has been low for quite a while now, to the point that many farmers don't feel motivated to continue in farming. Um, and Many might think that because we are in a niche market or because you deal only with specialty coffee, um, that this that has nothing to do with the sea market. But um, lots of specialty coffee um, actually uses the sea market um, to hedge and as a um, market basis. And also specialty coffee greatly depends on the infrastructure of commodity coffee. And um, at the point, the sea market is the only price discovery mechanism that we have, which doesn't really take into account factors like inflation or increases in minimum wage or anything related to production costs. Um, so today, and um, still having the sea market at a critical point, we can say that we are in a price crisis. Um, and we will be discussing some short-term and long-term effects of um, this crisis and also how our industry is reacting to um, the situation. So we're all also going to be talking with um, our guest speakers that I'll be introducing uh, shortly, um, different perspectives on sustainable models and um, what they're doing within their own businesses to counteract this. Um, and most importantly, this is a really big topic and we only have one hour to talk about it. So we don't hope to provide a solution for this really complex issue, but more um, have a conversation and provide a platform to exchange ideas. And like Kim mentioned, we will be having more webinars in the future. So um, we hope that you can join us for the rest of them. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speakers today. We have Fer Herbert Peñalosa, which, who is a Colombian coffee farmer and roaster. Hi, Herbert. We have Ed Canty, General Manager of Co-op Coffees. And we also have joining us today, Janina Graves, who is a PH candidate on private sustainability governance. So thank you all for joining us today. And um, we'll go ahead and dig right into the current situation. So Janina, I'll start with you. Um, based on your expertise, what observations do you have on how we got here and where we are at today? Yeah, thank you so much, Ashley, for inviting us to this interesting discussion. So um, I think there's three factors that led us to where we're at today. And where we're at is that we have a coffee price um, slump that has been um, decreasing, coffee prices have been decreasing for the last 22 months. Um, currently, I think we stand at 
98 um, cents to a pound in the C market. Uh, there's three factors that I want to mention. One is that actually, unfortunately, it's not that unusual to um, witness price boom and bust cycles in coffee because we are in a liberalized commodity market where um, demand and supply are meeting through this price discovery mechanism and coffee farmers are trying to adjust their supply based on the current um, prices in the market. Historically, that we have um, price peaks followed by larger periods of price slumps because in a lot of instances, um, once prices peak because of weather conditions, um, a, a drought for instance, uh, coffee farmers will expand their production and given that it takes three to five years for coffee plants to um, mature and to have yields, we then see a lagged um, oversupply of coffee. And um, this is currently also happening. We have one of the largest expected um, production volumes. But I think in this current situation, there's two additional factors that we need to take into consideration. One is um, our increasing reliance on Brazil. So it is the largest producer. It is now stands at 36% of worldwide production um, and is slated to increase. There's um, projections that it will be 44% in 2024-25. Um, and so um, the entire world market then depends on local conditions in Brazil. And currently there's two, one very, very high yields, the largest ever recorded, which have created a, um, uh, a supply of coffee that is at almost 60 million bags, some of the most, um, the highest production volume that we've seen in the past. And current political conditions have created um, depreciation in the Brazilian real, making coffee really cheap in US prices. And so that of course influences the entire um, C market, um, despite the fact that a lot of other currencies um, fluctuate differently. And the last point that I want to mention is that we do also see increasing amounts of price speculation in the market compared to previous periods. So because analysts have seen that there is this um, decrease in prices, a lot of speculants on the stock market are betting on increasing um, price decreases. So they're trying to sell more and more um, futures contracts which means that there is a artificial oversupply so to say in the C market that has also led to um, kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy as everybody is betting on the price to decrease. It's decreasing further despite the fact that the underlying fundamentals might be different. Thank you, Janina. So Herbert, what um, are some of the challenges that producers are facing with this these low prices? And maybe you can talk about some of the short-term and long-term effects um, for you and also for your community. Well, um, you, were, you were completely right when when you were saying that about um, the the commodity market uses uh, the specialty market uses a lot of the infrastructure of the of the C market. I mean, we 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 just deal with specialty at my farms and probably well all around the project we have, but uh, but we've seen that a lot of producers that used to leverage their like they said, the production costs with the with the C market are, are having problems to finance themselves. For example, one one of the things that uh, I don't know if you if you produce fifty percent of your farm in specialty, uh, well, the other fifty percent is just a, well it works as a as a cash crop. You just you just uh, you sell that. Hold on, sorry. Cell phone selling right now. Sorry about that. Uh, you just you just sell 50% uh, and go to a town and sell it to a cop. So that gives you money, well, to to work in the specialty as well. So that's one of the things we've seen. Um, short term, some regions we work at, uh, we've seen growers uh, focusing in some other crops. Is regulated by two factors. One's, one is the 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 C price, the international C price, and the other one is the the exchange rate. So if the if the C price drops, the local price drops as well, 
and um, the roast coffee market also suffers a little bit. So um, we, we we sell a lot of uh, roast coffee locally, and what you see in the years that that coffee is low, uh, the following year and the following two or three years, uh, the prices for roast coffee also drop a lot. So that that hurts the market a little bit as well. That's kind of how it goes for us. Thank you, Herbert. And um, Ed, do you have any other challenges that might be particular to co-ops or small producers um, due to these extremely low prices that in your experience of working with co-ops? So I, I asked our uh, sourcing manager this yesterday how things were going, uh, particularly with the Peruvian crop. He's a Peruvian crop, and he said so far, um, it seemed they were finding homes for coffees at least as certified. So we're, of course, buying fair trade organic, um, and they're at least able to sell it at a, a fair trade conventional price, which would be $1.60, right? So so there was that. Um, for me, my personal experience, I mean, I cut my teeth on coffee uh, when it was at 41 cents back in the day. That's when I started. So I've seen it um, and got involved in the fair trade movement when it was really low. Um, and I... I think what I'd say is a lot of these co-ops are going to erode some of their social uh, aspects, their social functions. Um, they're going to have to uh, take away from that. Um, producers, uh, uh, families, there's going to be a demographic shift on uh, children or, or, or commonly the men having to go up north to, to work, uh, to remittance and sending money back home. Um, and I mean, it, the list goes on. I mean, it gets really, the lower it goes, the worse it's going to get. And I think, I think Herbert spoke to a lot of these issues. The one other thing I'd, I'd mention, um, and this is something that's hard to remember, is markets go up and markets go down. And a risk that's not often talked about is when the market goes back up, a lot of these producer groups are not going to have the tools if the market stays low long enough um, to do price risk management. Uh, when the market goes up, they're going to be in situations as well that could put some of those cooperatives out of business. Um, good short-term producers are getting more money, but we can't lose the muscle of using price risk management tools uh, as that market goes back up. Now, that's that's a ways away, but I try to think about these things, whether it's a high market or a low market, but what we got to cover um, for risks. Great. Thank you, Ed. Um, and Herbert, um, tell us a little bit about your business um, and the model that you have going on and maybe more specifically you can tell us um, what were your revenue expectations when you started managing your farm and are you meeting those goals today? Uh, no, by no means we're meeting them, um, but we're fine with that. We're fine with that. Um, we, 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 see, we see the business as something different for us. Um, we started, we started probably seven years ago. Uh, my family used to work with coffee before. I don't, I don't have a trace back with that generation because, well, I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with the business before, but, um, we started growing coffee again, probably seven years ago with the promise that it was going to be an spectacular, a spectacular business. Uh, but we didn't know anything about specialty. We were working on, on, on commercial coffee. Uh, when I started going to the farm, we got into specialty, and that, well, that that was the thing with the with the, with the story. I started managing the farm around four years ago. My uncle uh, passed away, so I had to move like almost full time to the farm. I closed my company, and I got into coffee. So I got I got into. Uh, Sorry, Herbert. I don't think he can hear us. I think you might have um, gotten mute there for a bit. We'll we'll wait on you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It keep it keeps dropping. Sorry about that. So yeah, so go back a little you, bit. <laughs> yeah. So I was telling you that uh, for me as a grower, uh, I don't I don't see the business outside of specialty. I mean, I don't I don't really understand with 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 the prices we pay for labor, with what it costs to set up a farm and all that. It's really expensive to sell copies out of a specialty. 
for us, uh, our sale price farm gate has to be on an equivalent of probably 135, 140 for us to make even, just to make even. So if, if, if we make anything under that, it's, 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 well, it's, it's very bad news. And I know that's the situation for a lot of the people we work with, going back to the people we work with. So um, we see our farm right now mostly as an experimental farm. We do, we do specialty, we do microlots, nanolots, uh, but we, we, we just do what we do to break even at the farms. Um, probably uh, there's, there's a thing nobody talks a lot about in, in, in the coffee industry is that the business of farming, it's as well as um, real estate business. So uh, we buy the farm, we work the farm for years and 10 years, 20 years from now, our farm costs a lot more money. So we want to buy out of business, we just sell the farm. That's, I mean, that's that's the truth as well in the business. And uh, that works in a lot of regions, that's work for the region we have. So it's a financial game. Of course, we're not in coffee because of that. We're in coffee because of some other things, because we like it or because we, it's a good business for us. So the second thing we do is that um, we, we, we boost an association, a local association, uh, for a lot of our neighbors, uh, we're 10 right now, just a small number, so we're kind of a small cop. Uh, we all work in specialty. I have neighbors that do 95% of their crop in specialty. They don't deal, deal with C market anymore. And they're, they're from small holders that have probably one hectare or two hectares to people that has probably 15. That's, that's the size. I'm one of the small ones. We have seven hectares. We're setting up a new farm, but our current our current thing is seven hectares. And the other side of the business is it's a collective we created um, like 16 months ago that uh, we are right now probably 45. I have to check the number. Probably 45 coffee growers exporting together. So it's um, like 10, 12 lead farms and some farms that are attached to those farms uh, selling specialty. And what we're trying to do is uh, try to represent those coffees. So we use all the infrastructure we have from our farm to quality control and to logistics and such. We use it uh, to help these other farms as well. Of course, we charge, we charge a small premium out of that. And uh, we help moving their coffees. Why we do it? Because we always had the issue that we weren't able to move our coffees the way we wanted to. So we're moving our coffees, uh, piggyback riding with a lot of, well, the old coffees from the from the collective. So that's what we do. Uh, regarding C market, right now the the price in Colombia, well, the price in Colombia doesn't doesn't deal with dollars. So it's um it's around 240 US dollars for 125 kgs of coffee in parchment, which is probably one Getting back to Herbert, sound issues. Um, well, Herbert, maybe while you fix the audio, um, I will move on to Ed and then head back to Herbert. So we take advantage of our time, but um, Ed, why don't you tell us a little bit about Co-op Coffee's model and um, let us hear about that. For pricing? Um, okay, so to back into it, we are 23 uh, uh, roaster members uh, in the U.S. and Canada um, who collectively use us as an importer, as cooperative coffees. Um, you know, the, the, we buy fair trade and organic predominantly, about 98% of it. Um, so we were already doing the $1.90, which was a minimum. Uh, last, I'd say January or February, we finished a project where we actually moved our minimum to $2.20 um, for fair trade organic at the base of about an 84 score. Um, and a lot of this was off of the work of an organization called the Small Producer Label, the SPP, um, which we weren't looking at as a label, but the majority of our producers were part of this certification cooperative. Uh, and we looked at their standards as an advisement, um, saying, hey, you know, we think 220 is a, a fair price for fair trade organic. Uh, we took this to our membership. Um, I won't say anytime you raise prices, it's not an easy business decision but 100% of our members supported moving our minimum price up to 220. Um, truth is for us, um, we did offer prices higher than that. That's just the, the minimum or for the quality. 
Um, on average, uh, in the last year, our minimum price for all origins that we buy from was 244, and the average FOB price we paid. Um, I want to back. I'm not sure who's on this call. When FOB, we're talking the price paid uh, to get it out of that country um, was about two dollars and sixty cents. Um, and so every time we're talking prices here, um, I'm really talking about the price we provide that country of origin. Uh, and there's always an exporter involved and a lot to get down to the producer. But there's also the fees of the importer. So so anyone who's a roaster is saying, wow, that's I pay much more. Well, you got to look at all the little pieces of your price. So let me backtrack there. Um, so we raised this before this current crisis uh, was, was happening. I would, uh, I'm trying to think of if I caught all of your points. Uh, what tools do you have? Yeah, I mean, that's that's been our model. Um, and it's, it's for me, it's really, our, our model is about engagement. 93% um, of the copies we buy are from relationships we had for three years or longer. Um, I tout that statistic all the time. I think it's very fair. Uh, that, and uh, something to be transparent about in this industry is we all should be talking about how much we stage, uh, stay engaged with producers. Because regardless of price, the big fear here is that uh, buyers who just go out and bid for the lowest price are going to go buy the copy somewhere else. And a lot of producers don't feel they can raise their hand and say, hey, here's what I really need is the cost of sustainable production. So the biggest part of our model is that we try to stay engaged with our supply chain. It's never 100%. You always make some decisions on bringing on new groups or maybe for some reason something did not work out with the producer group. It does happen. Um, but we try to measure ourselves on making sure that we stay engaged with the producers that we work with. Did that answer it pretty good? Um, oh, yes. I have one other part. The other thing about pricing, we, we, there's also when we talk minimum price, so we said we moved to 220. Um, that's actually not so as the long as the markets we don't pay 220 market price we pay 220 minimum price for the producer group there's a premium associated with copy in general our premiums around 60 cents for, for Latin America so if you take the 220 and subtract that 60 cents you get to a um, dollar 60 so for us that's what I would call the trigger price so we guarantee producers a commodity price floor of a dollar 60 plus 60 cents 220 so that's the number we look at um, is, is when the market's at a dollar, we know that we're offering uh, 60 cents more um, than, than what they can get off a commodity price. Perfect. Thank you, Ed. That's a very interesting model. And how many um, members does, roaster members does Co-op Coffee have at the moment? Uh, we have 23 members uh, in the 20. US and Canada. Huh. Interesting. And, um, Herbert, do we have you back? Yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. I just, I just switched. Um, I just switched my computers to a new one really fast, so I, I think this, this one is going to work properly. That was super fast. I'll let you finish your thoughts because I know we cut you in the middle, and then I have one more question for Ed on your yeah, business. Yeah, all good. Model. Thank you. Uh, no, I was, I was telling you. So we, we created this collective a couple, well, like 18 months, six months, 16 months ago, and uh, we we did a small load to the U.S. And basically, it, it was kind of the same we were doing with with our farm, just roasting the coffees. <laughs> we seem to have lost you again, Herbert. Yeah. I think it's your it's your headphones, Herbert. So I would just use your internal microphone. The, yeah, maybe the internal microphone. No headphones. It's condition that the internal microphone larger uh, headset. Hmm. Yes, yeah, we can hear you. There we go. You. Perfect. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the headphones out. I'm, they're not liking the the software. Sorry about that once again. Okay. Uh, so yeah, Herbert, we, we Herbert, we have a question from the audience. Um, what, um, where in Colombia is your farm, and where, what community do you work in? Uh, well, the farms are the my farm is in northern Tolima. We have two: one in a town called Palo Cabildo, and the other one is in a town called Casabianca, which is forty-five minutes out of there. Yeah. And uh, the association is in that region, so we have 10 producers in that area. But uh, we, we also work in Santander, Nariño, Cauca, and Risaralda. And uh, there are a couple members from all around the country trying. OK. 
Hey, someone tell Herbert. <laughs> okay, I think we lost you again, Herbert. Sorry. Yeah. Well, we'll let you fix that, and then now I'll go back to Ed because <laughs> we only have one short hour. But um, Ed, so what efforts um, are you at you guys at Co-op Coffee doing to mitigate the effects of the low prices right now? So are you working on any tools um, to mitigate price volatility or risk? Yeah, I, I just say, Herbert, if you he's putting out some really good facts and it's a shame because it's right when we're really getting into it that it cuts out. So if you want to type anything, I'll read it. <laughs> just want to put it out there. Um, because uh, yeah, he's, he's got some great stuff going in there. But okay, what, what can happen? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> All right, so price volatility. Um, so the first part is as a collective of roasters, um, we do some price averaging. Um, so of like products, we kind of average our pricing um, so we can kind of flatten the volatility for our members over time. Um, and that's of the price going up, of course, because we're roasters. Um, it's, a, it's a physical hedge uh, and producers do it for the exact opposite reason. Um, what we're starting to get into is using um, what I've used in the past, which is futures and options derivative products. Um, but uh, the riskiest thing about, uh, you, you gotta take your time uh, because managing risk is risky. So we're taking little steps forward, making sure we learn as we go as an organization. Uh, but we're, we're hoping to start using some uh, options. So when the price does come back, uh, back up, we can flatten that volatility. And that's the volatility as an importer. You know, we have to go to the bank for more money when the price goes up. And for, for roasters, it's just, you know, their margin goes down. So the more we can stream that out, the better from our perspective as a buyer. Um, and then I get, would get really excited to um, turn around and start managing counterparty risk with our producer partners. You, once we learn those tools, you can turn around and actually make sure that uh, producers have a, a policy to do a, a physical hedge or something to manage their risk. Um, and then also look into futures and derivative products. Um, so that's the direction we're going in. Um, I do not believe the, the market's a reality. We don't have to like it. Um, but and, and in this low C markets, everyone's like, it doesn't matter anymore, particularly if we give a minimum price. Um, but at some day it does go up and we want to make sure we're prepared for that. Yeah, I think your model is really interesting. And at the end, what we want to see is more stability in our mar market than not, you know, this volatility that is not good for anybody. Um, and I hope the audio is working right now because we really want to hear you, Herbert. Um, we'll give it one more try. Um, and um, go for it. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what's going on. It's weird. Just, just what I'm talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so I was telling you that uh, the whole idea was not to move uh, samples. That's, that's, it's a pretty, pretty important thing. What we did last year is that we were not bringing green samples to the clients. Um, we, I was just meeting. Well, I did the sales from the first container personally, and I, I had help from a couple of friends, but. Um, the first thing we did, we did was moving roast samples ourselves. We were roasting them and that I was telling the clients that we already knew what we had in our hands. So that's, that, that's a pretty important thing and specialty. And um, I, I think Ed, you said something about that is that probably money is not the answer to a lot of the problems coffee growers have. Probably we need to know a little bit better what we have in our hands. So if, if, if the price is X, but what we can learn of copying, roasting, market, uh, processing, growing. I mean, there's a lot of things you can learn. Uh, and that's that's why you, you add it to X. It's like we, we, we probably don't, don't need huge premiums, but we need uh, to know more about the market and to be a little bit more uh, assertive with what we do at the farms. I think that's the word. And it's like if you, if you, if you want to do specialty, if you want a better price, well, uh, right now, how specialty works in most of the places we work at as well, and probably you've seen that as well, is that you have 100 producers and 10 of them are doing something great, but just out of luck, just because they had one Celsius degree more on their drying beds or one Celsius degree more on their uh, fermenting tanks and their fermentation was a little bit better. But uh, but that that's that's just luck. But if, if, if we know a little bit more about our processing, that, that was the last part I'm going to tell you. The whole, uh, the whole uh, spirit or the whole soul of the collective we have right now is that uh, we learn our things uh, and the other people that's in the collective also learn their things. We're, we're sharing them together between like
Gosh, and right when we're getting to the good part. <laughs> no problem. Um, we'll definitely circle back to you, Herbert, because it's really interesting, everything that you're telling us. Um, I'm going to go to Janina right now. And, um, you know, our industry has seen um, many um, initiatives, you know, private sustainability standards, um, third party labels, um, but we kind of keep on circling back to the same issues. Um, why do you think this is? So that's exactly what um, my main research focuses on, how the um, how voluntary sustainability standards and other types of initiatives actually integrate into the mainstream commodity market. And I have to say, it's really not that easy to um, change the structures from the inside out, right? So um, there, there's two components. One is that um, despite the fact that fair trade initiatives, especially the ones that focus have originated in the first, one of the first coffee crises in the 2000s, have um, grown in, um, in their share. There's still a very small share of the overall market. So even the cooperatives that we work with, um, they're not able to sell their entire crop to fair trade um, purchasers most of the time. So a lot of times they still um, sell up to half of all of their um, production on the commodity market. So we see that there's a disconnect between um, the amount of demand for sustainable coffee that has sort of this um, focus on mitigating low prices and price volatility. And added to that, in the recent decades, we've seen a lot of additional types of certifications that don't really address that, that crucial point. So um, many other label labeling initiatives, um, they do trade is increasingly in competition on the on the roaster side with all of these other initiatives that of course tend to be cheaper for roasters especially when prices bottom out like this um, so in the end um, what those types of initiatives focus on um, and and the strategy also of a lot of um, non-labeling initiatives currently as I see it focus on productivity and argue that productivity is the key to a better farm um, uh, profitability, which of course on an individual level rings true, and we also see that in our um, in the data that we've collected. So we did surveys of farmers in Costa Rica and Colombia and Honduras. But on the other hand, um, the main focus on, on profitability and assuming that certification schemes can't really do anything about um, the pricing issue. Um, on, in the long run also doesn't help the industry, right? Because if we all focus on productivity, we see that the high productivity of Brazil has led to this crisis in the first place. So unless there's a way in which we can um, either scale up a minimum price model such as fair trade or um, have more structural possibilities of equating supply and demand, for instance, through having some sort of supply management mechanism, as used to be the case in the international coffee agreements, I foresee the cycle repeating at, at different levels in, in output and in prices, right? But in the end, labels such as um, Otsu Rainforest Alliance that add a premium onto the C market price, they can't really address these the issues that producers see currently, where even with a premium, they'll still be below profitability. Thank you, Danina. And um, we are sharing Danina's um, research paper for anybody that wants to um, get more informed on this topic. Um, it's a really comprehensive study that she made. And I don't know if she cut off for everybody, but there's a lot of information there that is great and really recommend that paper. Um, and Janina, do you have examples um, of other industries facing similar issues and what solutions um, they have looked at? Yeah, um, I think the general problem reoccurs in a lot of tropical commodities. One example that comes to mind is the cocoa sector where um, they're having many similar types of small scale producers in subtropical countries and they also um, trade on a um, stock market uh, and have seen price crashes in the past. 
Unfortunately, their situation is quite similar to coffee in that they used to have the supply management. Now they're in a liberalized market and um, there are certain private initiatives that have tried to come up with solutions that are very much linked to um, the, the solutions of the coffee market, such as fair trade. What was recently interesting, I just read an article the other day, is that the two main producing countries, so Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, actually came together recently um, to talk about a collective um, agreement on trying to figure out whether a minimum price would be possible to arrange from a producer's perspective. And so that kind of um, foreshadows a possible alignment on um, production quotas or some sort of output. I mean, it's a very early steps, I think, but um, in I think they're looking into the past and they're looking into different types of strategies that have worked, especially before the 1990s and sort of the, the liberalization movement where they had um, basically um, output, um, like there was, there was mechanisms in place at a national level that sort of um, maintain stocks in the producing countries and, and try to um, put the commodity into the market at levels that allowed prices to be maintained. And so interestingly enough, we see some of the same forum uh, in 2017, where um, Brazil and Colombia were, were talking about at least, and they currently put out an agreement, a, a statement as well saying, we need to get stocks back into the producing countries. We need to align our own producer strategies a little bit further to overcome this collective action problem. Because in the end, if every coffee producer on an individual level or every producing country on an individual level is trying to increase their output um, in order to overcome low prices, it just leads to even lower prices in the future, right? So there is this idea that if we can um, come to a collective agreement, um, which has happened in the past through the International Coffee Agreement, um, interested in the future and whether um, there will be any um, further institutional steps in that direction. Thank you, Janina. And I think that leads me to my next question, which is probably on everybody's mind. And I think a lot of our audience is asking this as well. Um, but what are your thoughts on um, specialty coffee as a whole divorcing the sea market or creating an alternative to it? And I think I'll start with Herbert on this one because I believe you're sort of stepping out of that already. So um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, with, 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 as I told you before, with our farms, I don't, I don't see any other way of working in coffee or because we had to set up the farm from scratch, uh, build infrastructure and, um, change varietals. So with that, with all the, with all the added cost, it, it, it's just, it's just, it's just, uh, too much for us to, to be able to sell it into specialty as the price is right now. Uh, but we've seen it more often, not just with small farms or with big farms we have a we have a farm actually in our in our collective um she's the director of the collective and she has a farm in pereira and uh they've been working in coffee for probably 70 years 99.9 percent .9 of what they sell goes to commodity market but this year we're figuring out a way to change at least 60 percent of her farm's production into specialty because with what prices are right now they can't they, they won't survive more than two or three years the thing is that, funny enough, with how the price is right now, uh, the bigger you are, the more it hurts you in Colombia. That's that's the way you see it. Because if I'm small, I can roast my production, grow something else, go and work on a bigger farm. But when you have a huge farm, I mean, for this farm and tell you, uh, one production probably costs, one, one week of their harvest, sorry, probably costs as much as two months of my harvest. So it's like their, 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 their working cost is huge. So they have to figure out a way to do it. But funny thing is that if you, if you have a, bar, a farm that big, it's, it's also something I, I think about it. If you have a farm that big, you shouldn't be dealing with cops and you shouldn't be dealing with, with well, with a lot of middle people. You, you probably should be working directly with an importer. 
because well you have a big farm you have you have the output to make it one or two containers by yourself so so then then going that going from that to specialty it's it's really easy i mean it knows that just by doing one or two things at your farm you can you can switch from commodity to a specialty right away just float a little bit better dry a little bit better and that's it then if you have if you want high grade specialty well pick a little bit better but I think the two markets are not that far away, at least in Colombia. Uh, for what we see in cups, is that their coffees are, are, are really close to specialty. It's just the market that's dividing them. I mean, how the market, and that's what I was telling before, is how the market works locally, is that you go to a, to a store in the middle of the town and sell whatever coffee you have in your hands or in your truck or in your farm, and that's how it works. But, um, and that's, that's, that's where all the traceability is lost. Well, at least in my town, there, there are towns that are a little bit more organized. But uh, I think the two markets are, are really close together, at least as I'm telling you in Colombia. You just need to start uh, like dealing with those coffees differently. I mean, copying each lot and identifying which producers are, are, are better. That's good that I didn't cut out this time. <laughs> Great, Herbert. Thank you. <laughs> um, and Ed, what are your thoughts? Um, on this question on specialty coffee as a whole divorcing the sea market or creating an alternative to it so i i have two competing i have conflict here i have two thoughts <laughs> and they're going to sound like they're uh opposite to each other um on the short term i i would say that um we can't divorce ourselves from the market because it's the reality producers have at least independent smallholders um in a higher market um, so if, if we had a fixed price at $3, that's great until the market's at $4. And then those producers are going to sell to the $4 market. Even if you have an alternative system, um, if a producer can get, you know, someone's paying on that mountainside more money, I don't fault them at all for selling to that person. Um, so I think we do, what we've tried to do is really build on top of the existing market uh, with the floors, with, uh, with higher premiums so that we are the best, uh, we're the best paying customer. Um, but I also want to, the other reason I don't like it is a lot of times people use divorcing from the market as an excuse for why our hands are tied. Um, and that it's, hey, we need to, it's a huge cultural shift. It's, it's, it's a giant undertaking to remove an entire industry from a commodity market. Um, so a lot of people point to that saying, well, we need a new market. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I would say there's nothing stopping individual buyers from using floors and paying higher prices. Um, and that's, that's why I have a knee-jerk reaction to when people say divorce in the market, sometimes it's just is pushing off the work later on. And how many SCA lectures have we been where people say that they need to pay more money? And then next year we have the same conversation. Um, okay, now the other Ed, on the other side of that, um, the C market's a human construct, right? Um, and I think Janina was kind of bringing up some points that, that I've been noticing is we have all these copies that are tenderable to this market, but that market doesn't consider that some of them do have floors. Some of them are certified. Um, your market fundamentalist, which I'm not, would say, see, that's proof why fair trade doesn't work, or that's proof why you know, some of these other things don't work. I, I take the opposite approach. That's proof that the market is not serving the industry. Um, but where I get stuck is, you know, we have to do what I was first talking about, but if we ever to remove, to get ourselves removed from the market, um, I, there's got to be a history on how this was done in the past. I mean, the market hasn't just been there since the beginning of time. It's evolved over time. Janina, I think others probably are better at the history of this and learning from it. And I'd actually kind of point to organizations like the SEA to help us guide us. How, how do we, would we do that uh, to build on top of it or to move away from it? Um, but yeah, so I, I think in a, is if I was to look at constructing a whole new model, yeah, we could do better. But I, I struggle with the first steps and don't want it to take away from people just paying more. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Ed. And um, I would like to ask Janina, and I know you got into this a little bit, then you already gave some examples, but um, maybe you can also add what recommendations you have to scale up sustainable um, buying models for coffee. And um, what are your thoughts you know, of specialty coffee as a whole divorcing the same market? <laughs> Thanks. Um... I mean, yeah, two points, I think, to that. I think Ed already brought it up a little bit, but purchasing commitments is really key from what we see in our producer's perspective, because it's really nice if a um, 
buyer says, I will buy sustainable poppies. But what we see a lot of times, especially in larger buyers, is that's, that they use this concept very fluidly. So they will move depending on their origin um, requests, depending on whatever type of um, mix they're doing in terms of a roast. And so for producers that are trying to adapt to a sustainable market, it's very hard because you have a lot of upfront investment costs in getting certified and in attaining the requirements of every different type of model. And if you are unable to then sell through that particular channel, um, the current strategy is to get multiple certifications, but that also again then duplicates the possible amount of coffee in that particular market. Um, and just creates a whole lot of um, uh, costs on the producer level that are not well taken up by by the buyers, right? So I would say, um, and I think Ed Ed's model, the co-op coffee model, is a very um, positive um, case in that you say that you are focusing on having larger term. Uh, allowing producers to have some sort of planning um, horizon in which they can make upfront investments, they can invest in quality as well as sustainability uh, is really key. And we see in the field that a lot of cooperatives do use the fair trade um, model in order to then um, move to further steps in terms of quality because they didn't have the upfront investments to invest in a cupping room, for instance, or to train some of their own members as cuppers. Now they can do that and they can run this uh, this model simultaneously because as we've also mentioned, it is rare that all a, a cooperative or even a single farm can sell all of their coffee into the quality uh, market and above 85 points, right? So then also trying to expand that model or those longer lasting relationships further down and creating sort of a mid segment of good coffee that doesn't necessarily um, compete in the cup of excellence, for instance, uh, also allows buyers, um, producers to have, to, to experiment on those micro lots, but then to also have sort of more of a um, baseline um, buyer that, uh, that, that can, um, where they don't have to sell all of their other coffee into the sea market. Because in the end, um, focusing on quality it is, as, as Herbert says, probably the future, but it does also a lot of risk, especially for small producers who don't necessarily have the, the techniques or the knowledge or um, are, are trying out different ways to appeal to roasters in these particular types of uh, micro flavors, et cetera. Thank you, Janina. And um, I, I would say that a lot of the... Um, with all the work that goes into producing specialty coffee and these really high-end micro lots, and um, I'll ask this to Herbert, but um, what do you think as a farmer that a cup of your coffee should be valued at? Well, that's uh, that's like what 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 Ed, what Ed was saying is that well, <laughs> whoever pays better, right? No, no, no. Um, I think I think. Uh, uh, I, I will put it in the terms of my clients, the ones the ones that are selling our coffees now. Uh, we have clients selling coffees between three dollars uh, to four dollars fifty a cup, probably. Uh, that's that's usually how it moves in specialty, and is the same a little bit for the local market here in Colombia. Well, it will be one point five to two dollars in Colombia, but it translates to kind of the same in the U.S. I think I think that's 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 the price that actually a lot of a lot of specialty coffee shops have everything between three dollars and four dollars something. Um, the thing is that me as a producer, and and that's one thing for the producers that are listening to this is that me as a I as a producer I can't say how much a cup of my coffee should be valued at because the ones that should be saying that are the roasters. They are they are the ones that know their costs, that know everything else, they're the ones that should be valuing the coffees. I, I read an article actually in a, in a Colombian newspaper a couple of days ago. They were outraged because the coffees, uh, the coffee price was low, but uh, roasters were making a lot of money out of our coffees. That that was the main message. And I was like, well, you can't say that. I mean, just a roaster, just, just buying the roaster, all the permits, setting up the shop and setting everything else has a lot of cost to it. 
So I think I think it's really difficult. What I can say, it's 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 my point of view is that uh, what a pound of my coffee, of my specialty coffee, should cost to a roaster in the U.S. I mean, and and and, and, and I'm totally transparent about the, about those numbers. Uh, we're actually selling the coffees from our farm to 4.20 to five dollars. Uh, X Works Miami. And that's basically the price, which 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 I think uh, it's a price that will meet all of our costs and won't hurt the finances of the roasters, because well, we also know that there are high value copies that get sell at twenty something dollars a pound and above. But let's talk about the normal high price ones that are probably well above the, the cost as well. I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a game that plays on both sides, and Ed was was saying it right. I mean, uh, there's people playing low but there's a lot of people playing high as well and i think i think both ends should be should be met should be met because i know that producing an 88 plus coffee sometimes doesn't cost more than eight or nine dollars a pound put it, putting it in the u.s but as well there's a little bit of speculation in the market there and growers don't say anything about it they love it so i think i think that's one thing we've been trying to do in the in our, in our collective as well it's been it's being um fair with clients as well. I mean, trying trying to charge them what what our costs are, and well, trying to be a little oh, bit fair on that gross. side. Got it? Can we? No. I'm here. Can you? Hey, yes, of course, you're Actually, we're not hearing you. Yeah. Were you able to hear me? Now, yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a few questions from the audience um, about the possibility and utility on creating um, consumer campaigns, so consumer awareness. What are your thoughts on that? Um, and I'll ask Ed, since you work with a lot of roasters and maybe are a little closer to that end consumer. Um, can I follow up on that last question too and get to it? I just had a comment I wanted to mention. Yes, please. Um, and then consumer campaigns. I don't want to forget that. Um, so the one thing I was going to mention is, you know, a producer uh, organization, whoever they are's job is to collect a pile of coffee and then sort it into a, whatever piles they can to get the most value, right? So the top of the pile, they're always going to pull off and they want to do um, a specialty micro lot, and then they're going to have their 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 specialty grade. But at the end of the day, there might even be triage at the bottom. So it's finding a home for the copy and the best ability that they can do for themselves or on behalf of the producers they work with. Um, to that end, um, I, I just you know want to acknowledge co-op copies, we might buy two or four containers from a group, um, but we're not buying all 20. Um, and the folks who go out with the direct trade are buying a micro lot, they're paying more than we are possibly. We do do some micro lots as well, but they're buying the kind of upper premium of it. And that's great. The producer needs to get that value from that. And everyone's engaging with that organization. Um, so I, I think there's a room for all these different models and working with a group. Um, the challenge is, is we're all one piece to the puzzle. And so it's like, I can't offer higher prices, right? Like we, we do and say, okay, that producer group is now everything set. Um, no, they now they have to worry about all the other contracts that they have that might not be giving them as good of prices, uh, and, and that's just the reality. So I wanted to comment on that that I think we all kind of play in um, in that. So so you're um, a consumer awareness. Well, um, we're uh, we're 23 small roasters. We've collectively come together to have a bigger voice, um, and we're trying to get bigger. And and to what I was just speaking to, part of our of what our mandate is from our members is to influence the industry. We want to start trying to push on the industry to be, you know, to, to pay higher prices, to, to be more like us. Or we even want to be honest and push ourselves to be better as well. Um, so I think there's that um, awareness as roasters can, can form together through importers, through cooperatives, through associations to have a bigger voice, um, that it's not just a small mom and pop shop. Um, so when it comes to consumer groups going together, I think the, I, I mean, Back in the day, when coffee prices were 40 up to 80 cents, um, Fair Trade had an arm called uh, uh, United Students for Fair Trade, um, and they pushed. <laughs> they used to set up meetings with a lot of large uh, companies and say, "Why aren't Why aren't you buying more Fair Trade?" 
And so I would look at them almost as if they, they were coffee drinking college students. Um, so I think there is room for this. And as the market's low and, and more people get to understand it, it's a very easy message we have here. Prices are too low. Producers aren't making enough money. Um, I would imagine that we are going to see more consumer advocacy coming up uh, and pushing on companies to understand why they don't pay more or do they pay more. Um, so I, I, I think that's a benefit of having a market where it is today is we're going to see more of that engagement. Thanks, Ed. And yeah, I think the key, like you said, is kind of this coming collectively because maybe um, as a small roaster, you know, you can only reach so much. But at the end of the day, we do have to bring in consumers to, you know, think of all the things that go behind coffee or why this coffee should be valued as more and not keep the value of coffee stagnant as it has been in the past years. And also create some awareness, you know, what is behind that cheap cup of, cup of coffee? Because somebody is taking that hit and it's probably on the producing countryside. So um, I think um, we have time to take one more question. And um, um, let me check this. So. I think I'll ask this to, um, you know, whoever wants to take a hit at this one, but um, we all work within the constraints of, a, of an existing market. But if you had the mag magic wand and you could recreate the coffee market system to ensure a more sustainable and more profitable supply chain, um, particular, particularly at the farm level, what would, you, what would that look like? And what exactly would you change? And we don't have much time, so whoever wants to take a hit at this one first, go for it. Herbert, go for it. If I could do it on my farms, I would plant less coffee. Plant less coffee. Person. Yeah. And probably have better infrastructure for processing. One of the big mistakes we made at the beginning is that we were selling coffee that we couldn't dry. So in Colombia, there are towns that they receive uh, coffee wet, wet parchment. So we didn't we didn't have the the old infrastructure to dry it. So we were selling it wet and losing a lot of money. So probably infrastructure and plant less coffee. Have the amount of coffee you can process to make the best out of it. I think I think that will be that will be the thing. At farm thank level. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Is there something you wanted to add there? One yeah, word, I mean, maybe. From the farm, there's there's two parts. From the farm, I'd completely agree. Uh, regenerative soils, more productivity, uh, resiliency in the coffee communities. Absolutely. I mean, if I could poof, we've eroded that over the last 40 years, no, <laughs> for a long time. Uh, and uh, it, it takes a long time to build that back up. And markets like this uh, just eroded a little bit more. Um, so if I could do that, I'd, I'd, we, I'd love to put producers on a level playing field where um, they have healthy soils, uh, they have the tools that they need. Um, their productivity, if your productivity goes up, um, your, your price goes up, so you're making a living wage. Um, but particular to the market, you know, if, if I had to rethink of how a market could work, um, I, I don't want to say this. I'm going to say blockchain because only because I'm hoping someone will fund it. Um, but it's the idea, um, a lot of people talk about blockchain or getting that transparency and it's almost instant. Um, we have a market that is a little bit removed from the realities of the physical trade. Um, I would love to see that uh, people register purchases and people know and the market knows there's a floor price on all these contracts. Um, I don't know if you can get that live with producers because I think producers really got to react. You're saying how much are you going to pay me? You know, it's like you almost have to have the contracts first and the market first. Um, but this market could be so much more advanced with um, modern technology uh, and live information sharing and not really based on. Um, I mean, it's based on an 1880s model. Um, which hasn't really been updated when it comes to the type of inputs they have um, into uh, uh, informing what the market price should be for the scarcity or overabundance of the product. Thanks, Ed. And um, unfortunately, we are out of time for um, this webinar. But um, first of all, I would like to thank our guest speakers for joining us today. Um, you know, this was a great conversation and I really hope that we were able to transfer the sense of urgency that our industry has that we must take action. And because we're talking about livelihoods 
here. We're talking about people selling their farms, migrating, switching to another crop, which really threatens our future supply. Um, you know, the next generation of farmers doesn't want to go into farming um, because nobody wants to get in a business that is not profitable. And so we need to take action and we need to take action today. And I really like what Ed said um, about engaging in your own supply chain. And I think that's a place that people can start. You know, if you're listening to this, that's a perfect way to start. Um, I think as a group, we will um, be giving you all resources if you want to get more educated on this, if you want to learn a little more through the SEA um, platform. And we will be having more um, webinars, uh, hopefully in the near future. So thank you all for joining us today. And I'll hand this off to Kim. Yeah, I'm back uh, with you all along, just, you know, not visually. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, Ashley, for moderating, Herbert, Janina, Ed, for being on the um, on the panel, bringing your experiences and insights and suffering through some um, audio visual bugs at times. Um, I will be in touch with all of you because we have more than 75 questions um, at last count from the, uh, the audience. And um, I will do my best audience out there to, uh, to find answers, to, uh, chase down these panelists and get them to weigh in with their thoughts on all of these great questions. Um, so it's a, definitely a discussion that um, warrants more attention and we'll get it over the months uh, to come. And um, meanwhile, I hope that, uh, that you leave here feeling like you have um, some sort of sense of where you fit in all of this that you didn't have before you began. And I look forward to receiving your questions and um, continuing this conversation in, in uh, future webinars. Thank you all. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. <laughs>